so. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will come and that you will prepare each heart here today, that each one will hear what he or she needs to hear. Lord, I pray that that your Holy Spirit will just come and settle on this place. And when we're done, that we will each walk out inspired by you, convicted by you, moved by you, not by me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, to some, she is the most beautiful woman they've ever seen. And for many, she's the greatest emblem of political freedom on the earth. Actually, second only to the Buddha, she is the most recognized statue in the world. Her name is Lady Liberty. The actual title of the statue is Liberty Enlightening the World. But it's far better known for her more common moniker, the Statue of Liberty. Lady Liberty's lamp lights the way toward an ideal that still eludes billions of people on the earth. So many have fought to achieve what she stands for, freedom. And so many have fought to achieve what she offers, but far too many, even here, take it for granted. When Friedrich Bartholdi of France imagined his statue, he set out to create a woman on the move, a woman resolute in power, a woman of absolute beauty. When you think of the Statue of Liberty, do you think of her as beautiful? Well, most often in paintings and in artworks, Lady Liberty is seen exhorting the people to follow her. And probably the best one of all time is Delacroix's famous painting. She's the mother of revolution. She's the mother of equality. She's the mother of hope. She's the mother of ambitious freedom. And she's often depicted bare-chested, symbolizing the milk of true liberty that comes from her. But Bartholdi, he opted for a, a more modest Lady Liberty. One wonders how she would have gone over if he hadn't. Bartholdi loved freedom as an ideal. And he viewed the United States of America as the last best promise for liberty on earth. He was born in 1836. And he was not far removed from the catastrophe of the French Revolution. Of Robespierre's tyrannical regime and of course the guillotine. Intellectuals across the world wondered if freedom was even attainable. And thus, they looked to the upstarts in America for the final answer. Bartholdi, like many in Europe, paid very nervous attention to the rising death toll in the American Civil War. Indeed, for those who truly craved freedom, this was a pivotal moment. Would America end slavery? Could it actually conquer its dependence on that diabolical practice? And could it do so and remain a single union? At the start of the Civil War, the answer to that question remained unclear. Especially as a gangly, awkward, inexperienced lawyer stood now at the helm of the White House. Throughout Europe, as in America, cartoons of Abraham Lincoln depicted him as a kind of lanky Neanderthal ape man. Probably because he kind of looked a little bit like a lanky Neanderthal ape man. What truly hung in the balance, and Bartholdi knew this, was freedom itself. France's revolution had failed. So could a nation founded not on race or class, but on the idea of liberty, 
actually survive. Now, unless you slept through your history classes, you know America more than survived. Of course, America paid dearly for its early compromises, for slavery. Thus, it paid dearly for daring to take the hand of Lady Liberty and following her wherever she might lead. And in doing so, America sacrificed nearly 700,000 of its best and brightest in the most violent war of our history. In that war, the Civil War, America lost more young people than all of America's wars combined to this day. But that lanky, awkward ape man turned out to be the greatest political genius of our history. Lincoln somehow navigated a sea of extreme absolutists on all sides. I mean, he, he was hated in New York and Boston as much as he was hated in Richmond and New Orleans. He threaded a needle that I believe no one else could have done. In saving the Union, Lincoln saved the very idea of liberty. In saving liberty, he saved the belief that liberty could actually spread, spread into all the world. At the end of the Civil War, freedom's victory needed to be celebrated. Abolition of slavery and the preservation of liberty, this was worthy of remembrance. So perhaps it needed a monument or a statue. So Friedrich Bartholdi set out to create a monument to this moment. He imagined a gift that would go to both France and to the United States. It would be an enormous statue of Lady Liberty. And not because he believed that there was actually such a lady as Lady Liberty, but because he did believe that there was such a God-given ideal as liberty. Bartholdi's statue would be immense. And for a time, it actually was the largest statue in the whole world. He enlisted the aid of his friend Gustav Eiffel, the genius of the Eiffel Tower, to help form the, the statue's skeleton and even today, the statue ingeniously sways up to three inches each way. It sways, but it never breaks. In choosing a model for the statue, Bartholdi chose a beautiful Egyptian model with an ideal figure of the day. Now, you can't actually tell because of her long robe, but Lady Liber Liberty is very... Well, she's a very sexy woman. That is, for the mid-19th century. He envisioned liberty as a woman on the move. And thus, one foot, you'll notice, is raised slightly as if it's about to take a step. Because he believed true liberty wants to spread the light of her lamp and the whole world, and that Lady Liberty wants to move. In 1886, 21 years after the Civil War's end, the statue was finally, officially unveiled in New York's harbor. And the people admired her instantly. So much so that some actually imagined uniquely American alterations. For example, Thomas Edison wanted to make her speak with his new invention, the phonograph. And later, Walt Disney imagined equipping her with the ability to speak and to move. No doubt her meaning has evolved from Bartholdi's original meaning. As waves of immigrants entered the harbor, their vision of the new world was a welcoming woman lighting their way. It has since become a symbol of immigration, freedom for refugees and people hungry for a better world. No doubt, actually, the poem 
that's attached to the statue helps encourage this evolution. It's, an, it's a beautiful poem. Some of you memorized this in grade school. It's called The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. And I'm telling you, Irving Berlin's musical arrangement of it is amazing. These are the words. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. But what the statue truly represents is not immigration, but rather the freedom those immigrants came seeking. What it truly represents is liberty for all, a fragile condition that comes to a generation only once. The Statue of Liberty is just one artist's attempt to capture the God-inspired miracle that has been hailed by some of the world's greatest thinkers, such as Francis Alexander de Tocqueville and England's John Stuart Mill, or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, all of them crave the same thing, liberty. That statue represents the hopes of college students who carry replicas of the statue to protest. Now, make no mistake, I don't mean in America, where freedom is taken for granted or outright mocked on, Amer on American universities, but rather by students in the oppressive streets of Tiananmen Square, or Tehran, or Hong Kong, Damascus, or Khartoum. They carry with them replicas of the statue because it represents to them a freedom they give their lives to have, and many of them have. In Hong Kong, some time ago, the people built a monument, or really more of a memorial, to the protest and subsequent massacre in Tiananmen Square. How many of you remember that? Here is the monument they built. Notice the family resemblance of Lady Liberty. It has only recently been taken down by the Chinese government and destroyed. To us, the Statue of Liberty has become an easy target for parody or mockery or worse, for advertisement. To individuals who love freedom, however, it remains a glimmer of hope. The statue celebrates what the historian Cleon Skousen called the 500 year, or excuse me, the 5,000 year leap. Something indeed took place in this country which had never taken place in 5,000 years of recorded history. The miracle happened nearly 250 years ago. A new nation began to crown from the loins of liberty born on the basis of an idea, a marvelous idea, and not on the basis of race or tribe or language. And it would be a new nation conceived in liberty, a republic built on self-evident truths that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These founders, they aimed at an ideal so lofty that they understood and acknowledged that their goal would likely not be realized in a lifetime or in the lifetimes of the founders. But it may begin, though with fits and starts, but the founders fully believed that they had created a powerful but pliable vehicle that given time and if allowed could accomplish the ideal. And they called it the United States of America. That is, they had created something altogether 
brand new in human history, masterful from its conception. When a woman asks my very attractive doppelganger, Dr. Ben Franklin, oh, you don't believe me? He's like, come here. Before the Second Continental Congress in 1887, she asked, she asked him, well, Dr. Franklin, what have you created? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. The republic they created transformed every continent in time. The Constitution they ultimately ratified in 1787, only after the most difficult and often most unfortunate of compromises, is the longest active constitution in history. And it still goes on, even as many who enjoy its freedoms are calling for its abolition. Today, nearly every constitution of the world, nearly every one, bears its resemblance. That the average American can't tell you who those founders were? Well, to me, that's a catastrophe. That's a catastrophe of American education, American entertainment, American families, and American media. But the Gethsemane moment for this embryo of a nation took place in the Pennsylvania State House in the hot early July of 1776. The windows were shut so that outsiders couldn't hear the heated discussion going on on the inside. It was hot in every way it could be hot. Some were ready to sign, but some, some wavered. Most feared the military might of the greatest military power of the time, Britain, and all of them feared for their lives. And when it seemed to be that they had reached an impasse, John Adams, John Adams of Virginia, stepped forward. I love John Adams. He's a godly man, a God-fearing man, and somehow he understood the anxiety in the room. And he addressed them with the fervor of a prophet. And perhaps in that moment, he was one. And he stood forward and he gave this speech. He said, Mr. President, friends, sink or swim, live or die, I give my heart and my hand to this vote. It is true indeed that in the beginning, we did not aim for independence. But there is a divinity that shapes our ends. Why then should we defer the declaration? You and I indeed may regret it. We may not live to see the time when this declaration shall be made good. We may die. We may die colonists or die slaves. Be it so. Be it so. If it be the pleasure of heaven that my country shall require the poor offering of my life, the victim shall be ready. But while I do live, let me have a country, or at least the hope of a country, and that a free country. Before God, I believe that the hour has come. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready to stake on it and leave off as I began. Live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my dying sentiment, and by the blessing of God, it will be my dying sentiment. Independence now. Independence forever. And he sat down. Now something in this speech rings true to me. Because it's not merely an American sentiment. It is the cry of every human being. It is the cry for freedom. It is the cry that informs and reinforces my belief in Almighty God. For you see, it is not our natural state 
to be in chains. And it is not our natural state to enchain others. It is not our natural state to idly watch brothers and sisters in chains, no matter the shape or the form of those chains. We were born to be free. And we were born to free others. A mere 33 years old, Thomas Jefferson penned the words of the Declaration a soaring document about the equality of men and the periodic need to throw off the chains of bondage. Now Jefferson, like many wealthy men in Virginia, had inherited slaves. And yet Jefferson, Jefferson wrote perhaps the single most forceful condemnation of slavery and the slave trade into that declaration. He called slavery a crime against humanity. He called it piratical warfare and execrable commerce. And he called it an assemblage of horrors. He submitted his draft to his two best friends, to Ben Franklin and to John Adams, both abolitionists. And he submitted them on July 1. No one knows when it happened, but somewhere, somewhere between July 1 and July 3, Jefferson's anti-slavery paragraph was removed. Likely, it was the anti-slavery signers who felt it best to compromise in order to save the document and fight that battle another day. Without the compromise, there likely would have been no declaration, and there likely would have been no republic. But sadly, the entire country would fight that fight another day in about four score and five years later. All 56 men, all 56 men from 13 colonies who signed that document believed history was arcing toward freedom. Yes, freedom for men and women. Freedom for people of every color. Freedom for people of every upbringing. We know this because we have their letters. We have their pamphlets and their diaries. They were optimistic that freedom could be had by all in time because God intended freedom for all. This optimism, according to Jefferson himself, stemmed from their belief in a creator God who instilled it within us. You see, they understood that God meant for all to be free, and they were called to work to free others. God is a God of freedom. And that is why, and that is what we ought to celebrate this and every 4th of July. It is in this God-inspired pursuit of freedom that we find our purpose. And it is for this purpose that Jesus has called us. As Isaiah wrote, and Jesus himself cited, he called us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness the prisoners. We, like Jesus, are called to proclaim freedom, to proclaim liberty. I love the Statue of Liberty, and I hope you can hear the love I bear for her in my voice and in my countenance. But as a symbol of freedom, she is incomplete. Liberty does not come to us by way of a beautiful woman in New York Harbor. There's a far more lasting symbol of freedom. True liberty comes from Jesus Christ hanging on a vile tree. Only Jesus could manage to take the Romans' instrument of tyranny and torture and actually transform that hideous thing into our Statue of Liberty. Because of Jesus, the cross is the everlasting statue of liberty. I mean, to be sure, history shows us 
that it's often quicker and easier to impose control on others. It's easier to mandate our will onto others. It's easier to tell others how to and how not to worship. It's easier to dictate to others what they can and what they cannot say, where and when they can rightfully assemble, and what they can print or broadcast or preach. But hear me out here. Tyranny, even when well-intentioned, runs contrary to the creatures we were created to be. This is why. This is why we bristle when freedoms given by God and not by government are wrestled away from us. We were created to be free. Yes, tyranny is easier. It accomplishes its goals of justice far quicker. But its outcomes, however swift, always frustrate, rarely satisfy, and never exceed expectation. And always, 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 tyranny leaves desolation in its wake. Freedom, on the other hand, accomplishes its goals slowly, methodically, requiring a justice that loves mercy, that loves mercy and walks humbly. And freedom's outcomes always exceed expectation. Always. Always exceed the promise. Always kind of like grace. Sweet, amazing grace. And there is only one symbol that captures this remarkable freedom, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is for freedom that Jesus sent his disciples into all the world, not for political power or political ideals, far from it. As the Apostle Paul wrote, it is for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free. I love, I love, please hear me out, I love how apolitical Jesus is. This made it possible for his followers to be among some of the most ideological groups the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Zealots, Essenes and Roman employees. He had Republicans and Democrats even. But Jesus' message resonated with every one of these individuals. It is a message of real freedom. Freedom from the winds of culture. Freedom from the tyrannies of addictions. The freedom from tribalisms politics, and yes, even sometimes freedom from religion. Jesus sent his first believers into the world to proclaim liberty on every street, down every alley, in every household, in every temple, and from every lofty height of the world. We were born to be free and to bring freedom in Jesus Christ, and whom the Son sets free, well, he is free indeed, for real freedom only comes through Jesus Christ and none other. So lift high the cross. Lift high the cross and let freedom ring. Now I recognize how unfashionable it is to tout one's religion. It's kind of a strange self-censorship that Western Christians have foolishly placed on themselves but I have never, and those who know me will say this is true, I've never been very good at being fashionable or self-censoring. No other religion but that of Jesus Christ brings freedom. Period. All other religions demand the shackles of intense labor to achieve salvation the manacles of knowledge to rise up, the metal bars of rigorous discipline to be cleansed from sin. But Jesus alone extends grace to all. There's a wonderful and old-fashioned word for this grace, by the way, one we don't use very often. It's called liberty. Liberty to choose. Liberty to love. Liberty to worship. Liberty to assemble. Liberty in every situation to be more like Jesus. 
it is for the cause of liberty that all but one of Jesus' disciples were martyred. And each counted that a blessing. It is for the cause of liberty that many of the saints in every corner of the globe risk their lives to spread the gospel of Christ, which is freedom. It is for liberty's sake that many have been willing to die, even horribly, rather than bow down to tyranny. Many have sustained torture for it. Many have willingly worked themselves to death on its behalf. And they have all, all counted it a blessing. They were willing to give all for the sake of liberty, for the sake of freedom for all. That while we yet live, as John Adams said, that while we yet live, we might have a country, or at least the hope of a country, and that a free country. Let us celebrate how God has given us just such a country, if we can keep it. I love my country, but that's not the country of which I speak right now. I speak of a kingdom, a kingdom that is at hand, and as Jesus said, is within you. Let us celebrate this special reminder of the path that has been made for us, that we continue to push forward. Let us eat. Definitely let us eat. Let's make some noise, Mike Hevner. Let us ooh and ah. Let us sing and let us revel at God's mercy, that he has given us freedom in Christ and such a country that cannot fail. The kingdom of God. In his death, he has given us the greatest statue of liberty. But with his resurrection, Jesus has given us life. In his commands, he has made possible our pursuit of happiness. So I encourage you to celebrate. To celebrate perhaps with us tomorrow at 6. To celebrate with your family and your friends on July 4th, and let freedom reign. Let freedom reign. Father God, what a privilege it is that you have allowed us to live in freedom when most of the world cannot. Father God, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who do not live in such freedom. And may... You be close to them, Lord, be close to them, and may we lift up our voices on their behalf and worship you on their behalf because they cannot. And Father God, I pray that each person here who has yet to experience the true freedom of the gospel, that he or she will experience it, freedom from sin, freedom from fear, freedom from from fear of whether or not I'm even saved. Freedom from fear that I, whether or not I have assurance of my salvation. Freedom from addictions. Freedom from things that would get in the way of relationship. Lord God, I pray for each person here to experience freedom and then to answer the commission to go into all the world and spread freedom. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.